So you've heard me talk about George Headley. He wrote the book, How to Get Your Construction Business to Always Make a Profit. He's been influential in my life as a young GC and growing into my older GC days. Well, on today's show, I have him on my YouTube channel. He's sitting right here. If you wanna know the secret formula to always making a profit as a general contractor, then keep watching. So George, Thanks so much for jumping on the show, man. The YouTube channel, this is awesome. What does it feel like making a YouTube video with me? <laughs> man, I feel like a you know an actor or a celebrity, I guess. I don't know. You are a celebrity. I feel like a celebrity sitting here with you. <laughs> oh, gosh, you're over, over the top. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm excited to have you here. This is super exciting. You know, I've read your book. It was super influential to me back in the day. And... Um, one thing you say in there is a contractor can make more money maybe focusing on some higher risk projects or difficult work or high barrier to entry. What are some examples of maybe like high barrier to entry, high profit margin work? Well, for commercial contractors, I have a lot of clients that I help with a coach, business coach, and uh, I have peer groups and you know I have about 60 or 70 active clients and the ones who make the highest margins have a unique advantage. They're in a very difficult market to get into. For example, the federal VA hospital work, or maybe the medical dialysis center work, or maybe federal army bases where they work on the ranges where, where they shoot and practice shooting. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they're just the best known highest technology contractor in their market. And uh, they, they're not, they don't bid all day. I call that the low bid treadmill. You get on the treadmill, the plans keep coming, you keep bidding it, and you keep sending your price, and you get one out of 10, and you, you're busier than heck, and you're broke, you know, busy and broke. Right? What's, the, so, what's the point of working so, so hard for no margin, right? Yeah, I got guys who do 20 million and make 2 million net, pre-tax profit. I got guys who do 100 million and make 2 million that I work with. It's like crazy. What are you doing? Exactly. Life. So you, you explain that as volume hungry. Well, that's, I never say that, but that's a good way to look at it. <laughs> I, I used to say volume is addictive. Yeah. You get in and you just keep You're like, oh, man. it as fast you It's can. almost like you're kind of bragging to your friends. I'm a hundred million dollar. Well, what's your net profit, right? And yeah. I think a, so gonna, I've, got, I've got guys who do 20 million year after year and make 2 million. Yeah. And, and we're going to sit right next to him is doing 40 million making three or four or 500 grand. Right. Yeah. So we're actually going to get into that in a little bit in a couple minutes here about your seven step formula to always make a profit. So look, if you're interested in always making a profit and not being on the low bid treadmill, then keep watching this video. So I, I got a question for you, George. How long did it yeah. take you to write that book? Well, I write an article every month for Construction Business Owner Magazine. When they first started the magazine, Somehow they found me somewhere and uh, contacted me and asked me to be the lead columnist. So I've been doing that for way over 15 years. So I write an article every month, kind of a big article. And the article uh, is a business practice for contractors. So a few years back, I wanted to have a, a book so I could get hired to speak and credibility. And so I made a decision to take my 12 months 3,000 words per month equals almost a book. So I got 12 chapters finished. Oh, wow. And I, I go, I need more. It was only half the material. So I took the next year to finish the next 12 chapters or finish those each chapter, make it bigger. Wow. And then I got 12 chapters. Then I found an editor and a publicist. And uh, they said, you can only have, you know, 10 chapters or whatever. <laughs> so I had to squish it. But anyway, uh, that's that's it. So if I wasn't writing articles, for all my clients, I have a lot of systems uh, or, or charts and construction systems and steps and financial plans. I've got all that, but I, I didn't have a book. So, right. so that's what. Yeah. And so if I were writing, I would have never, you know, if I didn't have to write every month. Right. Yeah, it's amazing. And it's a, it's a fantastic book. Um, I'll put the link for it in the description if you guys want to buy the book. It'll be a link in the description of this video. Um, you can get it on Amazon. Yeah, it's an Amazon link. So what are maybe five ways a contractor could find good, high-paying clients? Well, Do we have to learn to, golf? 
Do I have to learn golf, George? <laughs> well, I play golf. I'm looking out at a golf course here in my, my office. I love that. I had an interview with my top three highest margin contractors. All of them said the same thing, relationships and expertise. Mm. So they focus on a certain kind of work that they're a specialist in. They're known as the best in that kind of work. Yeah. It can be food processing plants. It can be medical improvements. It can be, you know, earthwork with real tricky stream bed slope stuff. Well, I've got a couple of guys, that's what they do. You know, it's hard to get on a Navy base or an Army base. It's hard to work on a nuclear power plant. But what do you Those do if that dries up? Like, what if you specialize in an area that it's like COVID hits or market shifts or, you know? Well, some of my clients are in small towns in mid-America. And, you know, they got to do everything. So they do everything. Right. So they build Taco Bells, they build custom homes, they build patio covers, and they build they pour cock. <laughs> wow. So, wow. you know, so in certain markets, it's really hard to be just a specialist, like high-end ceramic tile in, you know, Podunk University, uh, Podunk, uh, Iowa. Mm. It ain't going to happen. You've got to do more than tile. you got to do carpet, flooring, base, yeah. you know, cabinet tops, the whole deal. So it so, does depend on which market you're in as far as the yeah. location, you know? Yeah, if you're in a relatively big city, half a million or more, or a market, right. yeah, you can become a specialist and easily do 10, 20, 30 million, depending on what you do, <clears> whether you're a ge general for sure. But a subcontractor, you know, you do 10 to 20 million, you can make a lot of money if you're a specialist. So I look for low competition because it's a high barrier to entry. The harder it is to get in, the less competition and the higher margins. Yeah. You know, anybody can bid drywall on a house or drywall on an office building. I mean, yeah. it's a commodity. Yeah. Well, anybody can put T-bar in and drywall and paint it. You know, that's like anybody can do that. Yeah. But how do I get into a medical suite that's got to be finished in three days because they can't close it? You know, they got dialysis patients got to come in every day. You can't close. So you got to work 24-7 for three days. It's hard work yeah. and high margins. Right. It's yeah. just like the federal work. The federal, you can bid the federal work that has unlimited bidders, or there's certain market uh, project types that, that allow the federal or the state or the DOT or whoever to, to award it without bids. So there are different avenues. Some of my clients have their disabled veteran, their small business as SBA, uh, Minority Business Enterprise, they joint venture with other contractors who are MBEs or WBEs, women, and uh, they, they split the profit and they, they do great. You know, it's, they're still making their 10, they're splitting it with somebody, but it's better than making three. Right. Which, you know, a lot of these little guys don't make any money. It's crazy how hard people work and make no money. I call it stuck in a truck with no bucks, you know. Is your name Chuck? Phone. What? Is his name Chuck? Chuck in a truck with no bucks with a phone stuck in the low profit zone. He's stuck in the <laughs> muck. Chuck is stuck He's... in the muck in his truck. <laughs> well, uh, George. You can't get rich with your head in a ditch. <laughs> right. I think next, me and you should write a children's book about contracting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some out there. You see them a world of concrete. Some yeah. Books. All right. Yeah, so, sure. so, George, what is like the purpose of owning a construction business and how much... How much should the owner get paid? How much profit should the company make? Well, I always ask, why are you in business? And they always say to make a profit. And I say, how much? And they always say, as much as I can. <laughs> well, so what if it's zero? Are you still happy? No. Well, I can't aim at something I'll never, you know, I can't track. So I say, how much profit you want to make? How As much as I can. Well, how much is that? 100 grand, 200 grand. It's a number. It's not a percentage. It's a fixed amount of money. It, in 2023 or 24, whatever, I want to make 300 grand plus my overhead salary. So I got to pay myself my salary yeah. during the month, during the week. <clears throat> That's the first thing I pay, just like I pay my estimator, my office, my rent. I got to pay myself. Yeah. And then, I, and then I've got, so I've got my annual overhead and then I've got to make a profit. So that's the key. And most guys I would deal with in women, some uh, less, uh, don't have a clue. I say, what do you think you ought to make? I don't know. What are you shooting for? I don't know. It's like, it's like, man, it looks good to me. So and I always say, would I ever hire you as my president <laughs> if you have no clue? Is there a way to, 
you know, you talk about this in your book, but a way to figure that out, maybe based on how much overhead you're spending. So what we want to do is, first thing I always say is, what's your overhead? Mm -hmm. And they go, huh? <laughs> how much does it cost for you to stay open? Yeah. That's yourself as a president or general <clears throat> manager or owner. That's an estimator. That's your, maybe a project manager, maybe a, a bookkeeper, maybe an admin um, project administrator. Maybe you've got, obviously, you've got some rent and some phones and a website and all that. I, do so have, a, add all, I uh, have a question. So, like, if I'm going to say overhead, just to be clear for our audience, is that including the project manager but not the superintendent? Or are you coding project manager's time to cost of goods sold or all the salaries and overhead when you speak to this? So overhead is your office expense. It's everything that happens at the office. Job costs, I don't like cost of goods sold because we don't, we don't sell any goods. We yeah. provide construction. So it's job costs. So anything that happens in the job, I job charge. As a general, sometimes I'll job charge the project manager if I can get away with it. Some general contracts don't allow it unless they're stationed at the job site. So we have to, so that's, that sometimes is 50, 50 or maybe it's all overhead or maybe it's all office. So that's up to however you want to do it, but be consistent. But so your superintendent is a job cost, your trailer, your truck's a job cost. The equipment's not free. If you own it, you've got to rent it to your job. And it needs to be in your bid because you're going to eventually have to pay, buy a new one. Right. In so let's say so, our overhead is, for example, a million dollars. Yeah. How much profit should we make? So the national average for the last five to 10 years is 50% return on overhead. If your overhead's a million dollars, we ought to shoot for 500 grand. Now I do a survey of all of my clients and it varies. Some guys make 100%, 60, 70, 30. The guys are anything under 50 is a below average I always say best in class. I want my clients to be top 10 to 20%, yeah. you know, at the highest level, not at nobody. I mean, I'm in a big, huge room, like world of concrete with 500 people. I go, how many of you want to be average? You know, nobody <laughs> raises their hand. <laughs> how many of you are making more than 5% or 7% net profit? And they go, huh? Cause I don't know, <laughs> but 50% uh, return. So if you got a million dollars overhead, you should make 500 grand mm -hmm. net pre-tax net profit. Right. And that's and there's, after there's some, your salary that you pay yourself. And that's after it. Salary, the estimator, the project manager might be job charged, might be in the overhead. Yeah. How you run it. Yeah. Most like subcontractors will put it in their overhead because it doesn't really matter. Yeah. It's just because it, it, all it does is move money from one column to the next. Exactly. Now, it's it's general, still a company expense versus a job expense. It's all going to be on your bottom line. It's going to show. Right. If you're a general and you can get paid for supervision and project management in the line items for the cost, yeah, put it in there. Because mm -hmm. then your fee is lower and you get hired faster. Right, right, right. So, so, so you take 100 grand, you move it, and your fees go down 2 or 3%, your markup. So I want to know about this seven-step formula. Because I, okay. we want to always, me and my audience, right, we, we always want to make a profit. We don't want to do work for free. We're not in business. We would like it to be fun. Sometimes it's not so fun, right? So it's nice to make a profit. So what is that formula? So let me just walk you through. I, I've made a couple of slides for today and I'm going to share. All right, perfect. So I'm going to put that up real quick. Here perfect. we go. And um, You guys get ready to take notes. First of all, overhead is the cost of doing business. That's what it costs to stay open. You don't need a superintendent or a, a carpenter if you're not open. You're not working. So you send them home. So it's whatever it takes for you to run your business for the year. Profit is how much you want to make, and it's a it's it's compensation for risk. Risk. So you're taking risk. You're, you're going out there and building something. You're, you're a business owner. Profit is not the owner's compensation, or you know, I. It's not owner's draw. You get a salary because you want to have workers' comp and you want to have Social Security. So when someday you retire, you're going to get a check. <laughs> Otherwise, you're kidding yourself, right? And uh, it's taxable income. Get over it. Don't listen to the accountants. Mm -hmm. And then uh, how much should the owner get paid? The owner should get paid as part of the overhead what they're worth based on, based on the work they do. It, what would you have to replace yourself with a senior project manager, a general manager? Is it 100 grand? Is it 150 grand? What could you make being a senior project manager at a big company <clears throat> down the street? 
generally it's it's a hundred grand plus all the benefits. Let me let me ask you this, George. Why would I pay myself more and pay more taxes on employment taxes and everything like that versus taking a reasonable wage or whatever per the IRS standards of sixty or seventy grand or something along those lines? If you could go out, you know, I'm going to pick on Jesse here. You could go get a job as a project manager for a big Fort Lauderdale general contractor and make a hundred plus. I know you could. And plus out 30% benefits. So if you pay yourself 60%, 60 grand, your overhead's too low and you're bidding too cheap. And at the end of the year, you're not going to make what you should because you're, you're kidding yourself that your overhead's cheaper. If you're running your business based on taxes, you'll never make a profit. Mm -hmm. I want to make as, I want to pay a lot of taxes. That means I'm rich. <laughs> if I'm hiding everything, I'm not saying cheating. If I'm hiding, yeah. you know, postponing, it, it, it all comes to bite you. You're going to pay the taxes. Yeah, yeah. If you're a corporation or a sole proprietor, I don't care if it's a distribution or what it is. You're still paying the taxes. Right. But so let's just get our overhead right. Okay. That's all. Okay. And then, you know, so if your markup's 10% for overhead, mm -hmm. Don't kid yourself that it's seven because you're not paying yourself. Right. It's bid it at 10 because at the end of the year, you're going to lose money. It's all coming back to bite you. Mm -hmm. Don't kid yourself. So then we have a PL and we go, we got volume. So I just use 5 million for this exercise. You used a million for overhead. I've got overhead at 667,000 just because the numbers added up. Okay. 5 million. We spend 4 million out in the field. So we make a million dollar gross. Then we subtract your overhead and we achieve a net profit. So if you notice, the net profit is a 50% return on overhead. Correct. 333 divided by 667, 50%. Yeah. So it's 20. In this example, we're using 25% gross profit, yep. overhead, yep. and profit. Mm -hmm. So I don't care what markup you use. Markup's determined by your competition. What's the market allow you to make or to upgrade uh, up? charge for your work it, it's not there's not a national average it is what it is if your competitors are 10 percent, you got to be at 10 if your competitors are at 20 you got to be at 20 but you got it whatever you do you got to cover your overhead we got to break even and then we got to make a profit right so in this example we need a minimum 25 percent markup mm -hmm. which equals uh 20 percent of the sales. So a million dollars divided by five million is a 20% margin. So mm -hmm. don't get confused. I could spend two hours on that. But Is there a formula to tell you? So maybe a 200% a markup might only be a 66.66% .66 gross profit or a 100% yeah. markup might only be 50% gross profit. So in this example, 25% is 20% you know, margin. Right. So <clears throat> is there a formula for that or just it's just like, you know, it's just obviously it's always a less their margins always a lesser number. So so guys, like don't bid a job and put 20% or 10% markup and think you're making 10% or 20% margin because you're not. You're making less. So 10% you might only be making 9.09% so margin. There is a formula. It's my secret formula. <laughs> I will share. It's markup divided by 1 plus the markup equals margin. So 20% divided by 1.2 is what? 16.67. There you go. 5% divided by 1.25 equals 20% margin. There you go. So there's a secret. The other way to do it, I always do it this way because it's hard to remember. Yeah. Let's just bid a job. Okay, let's bid a job. Let's bid a job. This job's 100 grand cost. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now we're going to mark it up 25%. So it's a total... It's a $125,000 bid. Yeah. So that's 25% markup. Yeah. So if I take 25000 divided by sales, 125, that'll give me my gross margin. Right. 20%. I always just take a little sheet of paper and go, $100 plus 10 equals 110 $10 divided by 110 is 9.1. Right. Margins. Yeah. But, but we always mark up our jobs. And the markup is, there's no average. It is what it is. I've got contractors who who start at 5% markup, total overhead and profit. Mm. They're $100 million general contractors. Right. Their average markup is 5 or 6% right. overhead plus profit. I've got other guys who I'm sure you do too, Jesse, that mark up 30 40%, right? Well, yeah, especially for smaller work. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And as the companies get bigger, their markup goes down. Right. They go, why? <clears throat> because you've got one president making hundred grand divided by $20 million or $5 million. 
That's a huge difference. That could be three or 4% just for that. You've got one accounting person running the office or, or for 5 million or 20 million. Mm-hmm. So it's, when you're bidding a job, you got to realize if you're bidding against a bigger contractor, they're going to be cheaper than you. All their subs are cheaper and they're cheaper because you're using small guys are used to using 30% markup or 40%. Mm-hmm. And plumber that does 12, 15 million or 10 million is going to average about 20% total markup, where a plumber who does a million is going to probably use 40%. Right. And a lot of the home builders, they've got a bunch of their little buddies they use to build their stuff. They're ongoing contractors who just always charge to, you know, based on a small contractor. I'll, I'll kill them every day when I bid them. I'm 50 million in sales. Shoot, I'll kill them. My overhead's 4%. And most guys uh, that do 10 million ish are in the 10 to 15%, even as high as 20% markup. Right. For right. overhead. Overhead. So overhead is, you know, your salaries. Uh, and the benefits, including the owner or the president. Then you got all your vehicles for the owner and the estimator, my truck, my gas, my insurance. Then I got my office, my rent, my yard, utilities, supplies, phones, marketing, website, technology, accountant, CPA, hire Jesse or <laughs> George for serve help. There you go. And then you get, and he gets, that's where I came up with 666. I just made it up. Yeah. So that's our overhead. And then, and so the key is, I call it your nut. You got to, you got to hit your nut. You got to cover your nut first and then you got to make a profit. Then everything after that's a profit. Yeah. All right. So first thing I'm going to do is show you the national averages. If you Google, it might take a half hour to find it. (laughs) There's the benchmarking survey of what contractors make and they're always commercial contractors. So I've got the last four years here on the screen and 19, 20, 21, 22. But let's just look at 22. You can see the average overhead and profit. Here they are. You can see they go all the way to 27, 28% from as low as uh, nine and seven. And then the net profit is 2% all the way up. Well, that's last year. This year's better. Uh, the net profit is from four to four to seven. So wow. those are the average. So yeah, like, so 4.2 would be less than 25 million. And then... Three point yeah, under twenty five. These are generals. Yeah, generals doing twenty five to fifty mil, or, or average three three percent. Wow. It's funny, and then some contractors are over here. Yeah. You know, or subs, and you yeah. know, you're making more money, but you're doing less volume. Right. You're doing five million, you're making six. So yeah, six percent of five million is three hundred grand. Four percent of seventeen million, which is about the same size company, yeah. is these are three to four percent. The year before that, they made a little higher. Well, it's almost the same. It's almost always three to four percent. And this is what and people the, are showing yeah. on their taxes, because that's where the numbers are being pulled from, the data, right? Right. So you yeah. know, maybe there's some write-offs in there or whatever, you know. But oh, this is a survey uh, through the Construction Financial Management Association. Yeah. So they send it out to all their members, and you know, everybody plays a little game for their taxes. Some are pre-tax, post-tax, pre-depreciation. You know, there's a million variables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Distribution versus a salary. You know, so it's plus or minus. Right? Okay, so now that we know these national averages, what can we do to? How do we use this data? Well, that just gives you, you know, a rule of thumb. Now, there's. Mm-hmm. There's really no small GCs on this list. There are small subs. So yeah. just, you know, but, but I know when I was a $50 million contractor, my overhead was 4%. Okay. And I was trying to make two to three, which is the average, right? How here. many so, How many employees did you have at 50 million? 150. You had 150. Oh, because you were doing all your in-house concrete. I had my concrete was 75 and the rest was, I had 12 superintendents, six project managers. The other interesting fact is the average project manager can run about three to four million. Yeah, or more. Yeah, well, no, that's the average. Uh, average, okay. And uh, and I always see these guys trying to run work with one guy running everything, and he can't. Yeah. He can't go out the field and supervise the work. And, no. You know, you're, you're overloaded, and, and then you lose money. You don't have time to go find relationships and build better customers. Correct. And so you, keep, you stay on the treadmill, and you just eventually get burned out, and you call me for help. You know, and that's a thing, exactly. That's a thing that... Even I struggle fighting that mentality every day because, oh, I don't want to hire that new project manager and two more supers because it costs so much money. But if I can be out there selling, right, and using my time and efforts for playing golf. (laughs) So the big pressure, like the big pushback that I get as a coach, they hire me because they're in 
they're not making money or they got a problem. They, they want to improve, right? They've reached the level of pain. They can't take it anymore. They go, help. So uh, they call or they call you or whatever they do. They buy your stuff and then they never look at it, which is fine with me. They bought it. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. But, but or they call and we start a program. Mm-hmm. And I said, this is going to take a while. You're going to have to invest money. You're going to have to hire people so you can go get better work. And I can tell you, everybody who hired cheap made no more money. Right. Everybody who hired a pro, like a real pro who can full charge run the job, start project manager, start to finish, you know, superintendent, when start you're, to finish. When you're first starting a business, it's hard <laughs> to go out and get that $120,000 project manager that can do it all. It right. sounds good to guys like me and you, in theory, definitely, you know, you, you had a 50 million company and now you're just doing coaching, but me, my 15, $20 million company, you know, I, I can I can afford that at this point. But when I was 22 and I had a, I a zero million dollar company, you know, it was. Well, you do it all yourself. You you got to you got to start that well, way. Well, you know, you hire a secretary or an admin and or a part time bookkeeper and you do it all yourself. You know, I didn't even you hire a cheap superintendent, which means you still have to go to the job every day. Exactly. I, I had a cheap superintendent for like 40 grand. <laughs> And I had to manage everything, look over everything he did. I know. It's twice as much work for you. Yeah, exactly. It really, but, you know, you have to bootstrap it. The first five years in business are going to be the hardest five years of your life. But once you feel it's it's your, you know, entrepreneurs are in the risk business. We invest to make a profit. We don't hope it happens. If we don't invest, we go nowhere. Right. So we have to invest in ourselves. But I, what I was going to say, or I may have said it, the, the best investment when you get to a level where you feel somewhat cash flow f- comfortable, yeah, got to hire a pro. Yeah, you know, so so you're an owner. What are you going to hire? You're going to hire a field general. You're going to uh, like a really good superintendent or a general superintendent. Mm-hmm. Or are you going to hire a project manager? Or are you going to hire an estimator? Those are your three choices. Right. And you need a bookkeeper and you need an admin. Right. You got to have a good bookkeeper. I, the, the worst thing I see is these <clears> guys hire. This, cheap bookkeepers who used to work at a donut shop, you know, mm-hmm. makes me, makes me crazy. They got to know they, construction bookkeeping. Yeah. They don't know anything about retention over under billings, you know, yeah. cash flow management, you know, so we got to have the accounting handle. Otherwise you make no money. But most of the clients I work with, they call me because they're over budget on every job. So it's because they don't know the numbers and they don't charge enough and they don't watch, they don't have time to watch change orders or get three more bids or, I think anyway. it's important to say no to low margin work. Oh, yeah. 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 So, But you're so, I call it horny for work. You're so horny for work, you got to make cash flow. You got to keep your crews, but you're in the business to keep your crews busy, uh, which is stupid. No, yeah, you're in the business to make a, a profit. That's the whole point. Okay, so we've talked about so much stuff, and George is an absolute genius. He's like a wizard with all these math formulas. This is the secret sauce right now, the seven-step formula to always making a profit as a general contractor, correct, George? I mean, can a subcontractor yeah, use no, it? No, it works, it works for anybody. Yeah, a contractor. So any of you contractors watching this video, it's about to get real. All right, so when I sit down with a client, the first thing we do is a five-year business plan. And part of that's their financial plan. So we look at last year and try to predict what we're going to do. So here it is, the beginning of a new year. What are we going to do versus last year? Are we going to grow? Are we going to shrink? Are we going to increase our margin? So the first thing we have to do is figure out we're going to use the return on overhead of at least 50%. Right. So in this example I'm going to show you, we, what's your overhead? We start with your overhead. I've got to cover my overhead. And then I've got to make a profit. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, let's say 50% return on overhead. Okay. So I want to make 333000 So George, what I see you saying is you're working backwards starting from your overhead amount then you determine what return that you want to get on a percentage basis on that overhead, and that gives you your projected net profit. Right. You know, at the beginning we were talking about what, what's the purpose of your business. The purpose for, for an entrepreneurial business is to give the owner what they want. I buy stock in a company, I want to make a dividend, and I want my stock to grow. It's the same in your construction business. You want to make a dividend profit and you want your sales to grow so you can make more money. You don't want to stop. So we've got, in this example, we have a million dollar goal for gross profit, gross margin, 600 plus 300 is a million dollars in overhead and profit. That's my goal. That's my 2000, whatever year you're in goal to make a million dollar gross. 
And then I look, what markup can I earn? So based on the kind of work that I do, what's the markup that I'm going to be able to average charge on an average basis? Mm -hmm. Bigger jobs, I'm going to charge less. Smaller jobs, I'm going to charge more. But what's my average markup? So in this example, I'm going to use 25%. Don't use those numbers. I've, I've shown this at World of Concrete like 20 times. Mm -hmm. And people call me and say, I'm using the formula, but I'm not making any money. I said, this is a sample, please. <laughs> <laughs> they say, I can't. Anyway, so then we convert it to margin, like we talked about earlier. It's 20%. So if you divide a million dollars by 0 0.2, you have to do 5 million in sales. Right. It's just math. It's just math. So this number five here is, and there's actually, I guess it's a seven step formula, but you got some bonus things here. So the gross profit margin at 20%, that's the kicker that your actual margin that determines the sales amount. Yeah. So let's example, if I can only average 10% overhead and profit, I've got to do 10 million in sales. So this tells me what sales I have to get for the year at what margin and markup. So if I can increase my markup via better jobs, better subcontractors or suppliers, faster, whatever it is, mm -hmm. I can do less work. And make more money. Or make, and I'll still make my million dollar gross. Right, or make the same amount of money with less or, work. Or do five million and make more money, right, Jesse? Yeah. <laughs> so that, so now we're in the into the bonus section. All right, uh, cool. Step, step six steps, 12 step. Average job size, I just said 200 grand. So now we're doing a sales plan. How do I get 5 million? I got to get an average, the same average jobs, 200,000. I got to do 25 jobs. My bid hit win ratio, that's how many jobs you bid to how many you win. Right. So I got to keep track of that. If I, in this example, I'm saying I get one out of four. Now, let me ask you a question. And we've talked about this privately in the past, but I built a sheet internally where I bid track my bid hit ratio based off of dollars yeah oh i i track it two ways okay number number of wins and so it'd be a bid 100 and i got 25 would be a four to one yeah i also got i bid 10 million and got 1 million that's 10 percent on dollars yeah because a guy might you know like those those guys that run around and do patios but also taco bells Right. If, if they're going to bid 100 patios and get you know 20 of those but they bid four top you know it's like kind of like a Different. So, yeah. so I have my clients do track both dollar uh, number one and dollars one as a percentage of total. So I've got a spreadsheet and in my accounting do you, do templates. You take, so which one do you put in here, the ratio or the percentage? This, in this example, it's just four to one. I get one out of four. So maybe you could take the ratio, make that a percentage, and take your percentage of the dollars, combine the average of those two, and call it a day. Yeah. So what I do is I look at, as I track those two numbers, I look at, if they're not the same. So if I've got, what most people do is they win more of the smaller jobs and not the bigger jobs. Right. Which tells me their markup's too high on the big jobs because we're bidding against the bigger competitors. Yeah, yeah. So they have a choice. Stop bidding the big jobs or you got to bid them cheaper and do more sales. Right. You can't bid a $5 million job at the same- At 40%. 40% yeah. is not going to happen. You'll yeah. never get it. Right. You're going to have to bid it under 10, probably at seven or eight. So those are some subtleties to really knowing your numbers. Okay. So and if you don't know your numbers, you're just not going to make any money. Right. You're not going to be a good business owner. Right. So what, and how, I always say, would I hire you to be my business owner if you don't have a clue? <laughs> right. And so, I wonder I'm not going to hire you to build my bill. <laughs> <laughs> so number of bids required. So that four times 25, I got to bid a hundred jobs. Okay. And uh, which means I got to bid $20 million worth of bids. Yeah. So you want you so want twenty eight bids a month. Got I got to bid eight bids a month. Eight so now I can month. track that. Yeah. And uh, I can keep track. I got there's my whole sales plan right there. There it I is. Two a week. Yep. I got to bid two a week. That's four hundred grand a week. If I'm not on track, I'm never going to make any money. Exactly. Yeah. And you might have one big job this quarter or this month, and then a smaller bunch of jobs, and then it might balance out. But yeah, this is a great thing to keep you on track. Yeah. It's pretty simple. I went to a, a when I was first starting out. I went to a Associate Builders and Contractors National Convention, and some guy gave gave a similar idea, and I I went crazy because I'm kind of a numbers nerd, and I wrote it down, and I've lived with it. I'm driving down the freeway, and I'm talking to my banker, and he goes, "How are you doing?" For my bonding agent, I go, "I'm doing great. My overhead's a million. I want to make a million five. My markup's ten percent. We got to do fifteen percent, uh, fifteen million. We already got eight million signed up for the year. We're in great shape." <laughs> 
That's without a calculator. That's me driving down the freeway talking to the guy. Yeah, because you just know this stuff. Yeah, it's just like, so I've been doing this formula for so long. Yeah. And, it, you know, and then I'll say, I'll, and then I'll say to guys, what's your sales goal? And go, I don't know. Well, what do you need? I don't know. Well, let's figure it out. What's your overhead? How much you want to make? By the way, your markup. Boom. There's your sales goal. There you go. Boom. So now, so I've got guys that I see their numbers and they're, you know, they're too low. Yeah. So what do we have to do? Now we have to get into where we first started, Jesse, is what kind of customers, how do we get a higher margin, less competition, more difficult jobs, you know, like, like the residential guys are classic. Who makes all the money? The guys who do the really expensive, high quality, high tech homes, they make all the money. Everybody else scrambles around for the cheap homes. It's the same with tenant improvements. I know you do some TIs. Yeah. You know, yeah. Anybody can put in drywall and T-bar, like I said earlier. The guys who build suites and computer rooms and medical labs, there's the money. So right now we're building a 6,000 square foot ground up imaging center and it's very complex and not many GCs can do it because it's a specialty. You know, the lead line drywall and the epoxy coated rebar. There's just like so many things that need to happen for the MRI room. And, you know, it's a ground up building too. So all the site work and the utilities and, you know, so, oh, yeah. and, 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 you know, we're making a good margin on that because it's very, it's very special. It's not like a bunch of GCs chucking a truck is definitely not bidding on this. <laughs> well, and you probably learned, you know, you, uh, I've got a client who's done over 20, who's doing about 22 million a year right now in, in office tenant improvements, Right. you know, and uh, it, there's no money there, you know, and he has his own drywall crews, his own studs, metal studs and T-bar and doors and cabinet installers. And, you know, he's trying to maximize his profit by using himself as a sub at a higher markup, yeah. but he's still only making three or 4%. And he's so good. He's fantastic. Oh. So get yourself into the medical and laboratory work. There you go. Get yourself a hospital. Yeah. Or it's so hard. Or education. You know, or it's building so schools. Hard. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Building yeah. schools, you know, or just anything like that. I mean. Yeah. And, but but don't be bidding a public school with 12 bidders. Right. So it's like. Don't yeah. be bidding a, uh, a Walmart where they have 10 bidders. Yeah, I've never even done that kind of stuff. If there's that many bidders, I'm just out. Because I like the clients to see my value up front. They know Jay Lane. They want Jay Lane. They know our systems, our people, our processes. And it's just like, how could they not hire us? They might get another bid or two, but they're sold on us before we even bid. You know, This 25 or 20 or 10% markup, whatever you're going to use, you've got to make sure you hit it. The number one problem I see is we're late. Jobs are late. There's callbacks. There's punch lists. Jobs are never finished, which costs a lot of money. And they miss stuff. The estimator misses stuff. If it's an owner who's doing the estimating and project man, he doesn't have time or she doesn't have time to do a super detail and get more quotes. Yeah. So we miss stuff. Right. And that's the, you know, I see guys bid at 25 and a gross margin and only make 18. Well, they go back, they go backwards. I call that profit margin fade. Mm -hmm. That's the worst thing that can happen. So right. once we get rolling, we got to get our accurate estimating, no missed items, and never go over budget. Yeah. And if you have crews, self-performed crews, we got to get them on budget. We can't let them go over. We can't let them have extra overtime. We can't let them have not finish and come back later. They got to finish. We can't send them out to the job until the job's ready. You know, it's just just common sense. It's really easy if you think about it, but you're so busy doing too much stuff because you don't have any help yeah. uh, or enough help that you, you spend money and you don't even know. That's it. So, so George, I, I mean, we, where can people find you in closing here? They can go to yeah. GH or you, you tell them. I'll just show you one now. And, and we are, just so everyone knows, we we're planning on doing a, uh, a conference in October. George, more than likely, will be we're – talk, we're talking I'll be, about – I'm going to be there. I've, I've got it on the calendar. It's it's in Boom. black ink. Let's go. So anyway, I've got a book. You can get it on Amazon. You see it up there. Just go there. If you want to get a hold of me, just email me or go on my website and email me, gh at hard hat yeah. presentations. I've got, a, I've got 25 hours of classes online, hard hat biz school. There's my discount code, hard hat biz school.com, hard hat special, 33% off. There you just go. put that in check off. Check out, you get a big discount. So uh, anyway, yeah, I'm available. If you need some help, call Jesse, and if he can't handle you, I'll you know, we'll tell you to call me. So <laughs> I I'm will. Not here. 
George and I, George and I are going to become uh, more partners. We're hoping so. Definitely with this conference, we'll see how that goes. You can click the link to get George's book in the description. You can also click the link to get your conference ticket. It's heavily discounted right now in October. The dates and everything will be on the website very soon. But George and I are going to be there busting out some amazing content for you contractors out there. So click the like button, subscribe to this channel, and we'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.